Amen, and what a blessing to sing those portions of Scripture together and worship and praise to our great God. There is none like unto him. Let's turn in our Bibles this morning to the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 as we continue in our study there. Second Peter chapter 1, we want to look at verses 3 into verse 4. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 in 2 Peter 1. And we want to continue to consider the blessings of spiritual growth and the importance of it. The blessings and the importance of spiritual growth. 2 Peter chapter 1, Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's pray. O Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this great deliverance, so great salvation that you have accomplished and provided as a free gift to any and to all who will receive it through faith in Jesus Christ, because it is the righteousness of God alone that can save us from the judgment of God that is coming. And so we thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross of Calvary. And Father, as we look into your word, I pray that these familiar truths will stir our hearts in a new and a fresh way to comprehend in a greater depth the importance and the blessing of spiritual growth in Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. Thus far, we've been talking about spiritual multiplication, that God wants to multiply his grace and his peace in the lives of his children. And God wants to multiply it. And when you learn how to multiply, you begin to realize that the numbers go up quickly and fast as you multiply. Now, in order to learn how to multiply, we need to first of all learn how to add. And so we build a strong foundation through the knowledge of God, adding one truth about who God is upon another. And please be reminded in verse 2 that this knowledge is both of God the Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are three persons in the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And to the degree that we learn and know who God is, all that God's Word teaches us about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we will have His grace and peace multiplied to us because it's by that knowledge that we are multiplied God's grace and peace. And we want God's grace. We need his favor. We need his help each and every day that we live. We want God's peace because we live in a world that is filled with tribulation, a world that is filled with temptation. We'll be seeing in the coming weeks a world that is filled with corruption. And Satan seeks to bring believers in Jesus Christ down into that miring clay, the clay of mire, the 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 swamp of mud and muck that God has delivered us from when he brought us out through faith in Jesus Christ, having set us upon a rock, Satan would love to see God's children just sink right back down in that quagmire. But God wants us to be built up upon the rock of Jesus Christ in our most holy faith. So we need to know about God the Father. We need to know about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord and our Savior. And uh, in doing so, in learning these blessed truths, we are going to grow. That's how the progression is changing now from spiritual multiplication as an illustration to the reality we're talking about spiritual growth. That's what Peter's writing about here in this first chapter. As a believer in Jesus Christ, we see that's one who has like precious faith with Peter. Peter 
was transformed from Simon to Peter through his faith in Jesus Christ, God did a mighty work in Peter's life. And God wants to do that same work in the lives of each and every believer in Jesus Christ. And the illustration of a child suffices to help us to understand the importance of that growth. Uh, I just was am rejoicing that in the last few days I've heard of the birth of Titus Mayfield. Yep, got a few recognitions there. Lisa Mayfield has given birth to Titus. And uh, we thank the Lord that both mom and the baby are doing well and are healthy. Uh, the doctors recognized that there were going to be complications and so an emergency C-section was performed and Titus was born. And I've seen pictures, they're on Facebook. If you're friends with the Mayfields, you can see. If not, I'll have to print out one or two so you can see them on Wednesday night. But great rejoicing in the Mayfield family, great rejoicing in the relatives, great rejoicing in the heart of all God's children uh, who are supporting and praying for uh, the Mayfields. And so we see that beautiful bundle of joy. We also in my family have had a new arrival too down in South Carolina. I've been made an uncle once more over as a niece of mine has uh, given birth to a new child. And, and we're just rejoicing at the entrance into the world of new babies. But with all these bundles of joy that are being born all the time, there is a horror that would come if a baby stayed just a little infant, as cute as they are, and as cuddly as they are, and as tender and affectionate as we feel feelings toward them, if they never grew, we would be horrified. The reality of life is growth. That's what life does. We grow, whether it's in the plants and the animals or people. God has instilled within living things growth from infancy through adolescence to maturity. And so it is the same with spiritual life. God gives life when we trust in Jesus Christ and the illustration of a new baby that's born suffices to help us to understand how important it is to grow. And Peter writes here so that we would grow because sadly Paul writes to the church at Corinth and was saying that they were stunted in their growth. And there are tragedies of sickness, illness, disease, or complications that cause the physical growth of some people to be stunted or to not take place appropriately. And we recognize there's something dreadfully wrong because life is evidenced in growth. Well, the same thing is true in spiritual life. And we want to grow in Christ. And Peter tells us here how. There's three questions that he addresses in verses 2, 3, and 4. Peter talks about what the gift is that God has given to his children for growth. What has God given to us so that we can grow? We're not talking about the gift of salvation whereby we receive life. We're going to talk about what has God given to enable the growth, the spiritual growth of that new spiritual life through faith in Jesus Christ. Peter also addresses not only what is the gift, but Peter addresses the means of that gift, that is how it's received. And so there's a means by which this gift is employed. And Peter's going to talk about that. And then Peter talks about the result. He talks about the gift. He talks about the means of employing the gift. And then he talks about the result. What is the outcome of putting that gift to practice in your life. And uh, we'll get to see, Lord willing, the first two parts of that this morning, the gift and then the means by which the gift is employed, bringing forth spiritual growth. So what is the gift? Well, notice here in verse 3, as his divine power has given to us all things. What has been given to us? The actual gift is everything. God has given to us all all things that we need to live the Christian life. Everything that you need to grow, God has given to you. By his divine power, he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And notice how this is magnified in verse 4 in the word precious promises. Exceedingly great promises. Through these exceedingly great promises, 
and precious promises, God has given us everything that we need to grow. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is that what God has given to us, the gift, is not physical, it is spiritual in nature. What has God given to his children so that we can grow? Well, it's very appropriate that as the life we've received is spiritual, the things that we have received as well are spiritual in order for us to grow. So the Christianity that's out there looking for a mansion here on earth to live in, you know, name it, claim it, health and wealth, gospel and prosperity, is not supported in the truth of the scripture. That's not what God has given. He hasn't given you a fancy Cadillac or some Ferrari or something like that, hasn't given to us some kind of a 401k nest egg or golden parachute so that you'll never touch the ground, but you'll be safe. God has not given us physical things. Now, having said that, please mind you that God does give physical things to his children. He does, but those things are not the means by which you grow. <laughs> God has given us all things spiritual, whereby we may grow. And time alone is not the key for spiritual growth in the Christian life. It is possible to find an elder, someone who's been a believer for a long time, whether man or woman, and yet is stunted in their spiritual growth. That's a sad, sad state of affairs. Time alone. Now, time is necessary because it's over time that we experience by entering in faith into these precious promises, all things that he has given to us, these spiritual truths, that we begin to grow. Time is necessary, and it's a part of it. But it's not only time. It's employing those things that God has given to us. And it's not going to be a car. It's not going to be a house. It's not going to be uh, any physical thing that's going to cause spiritual growth going to be the spiritual things that God has given to us. That's important to get straight in your mind. And aren't you thankful that it's spiritual things? Because I want to ask you, which of those physical things can you take with you when you die? Even if you have a jalopy that's rusted and has holes in the floor, you can't take it with you. Just as much as the person who has the latest, brand newest Cadillac that will drive itself for you. That's what they're doing today, huh? Cars will park themselves. Car, the, even the cheaper ones will shake the wheel at you if you're not in the middle of the lane anymore. <laughs> and the other ones, they're getting ready to just do all the driving for you. Whew. I don't know if I'm ready for this new day and age. None of that stuff is what we need to grow in Christ. What we need are the things that God has given to us, the great and precious promises he's given to us in his word. All things. Notice, please, that Peter says all things in verse 3 that pertain to life and godliness. Life, of course, is the eternal life. And God's given us everything that we need to be united to him so that that united to him through faith in Jesus Christ is now going to begin to progress in a spiritual growth. Peter addressed this in his first epistle. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. He brought this topic up by way of brief mention, but he wants to elaborate on it here in his second epistle, giving a whole chapter over to the subject of spiritual growth. In 1 Peter chapter 2, notice, Therefore laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes, Desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. If you drink in the word of God, what are you going to trace? Taste. Answer is God himself. All of these things that are spiritual, these precious and exceedingly great promises, are truths about who God is. They're related to him. Whatever God has promised to his children reveals us to us something wonderful about who he is. And where do we find these things? In the word of God. By taking in the word of God like a little baby takes in its mother's milk, even so, as the baby grows by its mother's milk, the child of God will grow by the great and precious promises we find on the pages of Scripture. We're tasting that the Lord is good. Now, a little child, if it doesn't get its milk, will cry. 
and cry out for that milk. Believers need to cry out to taste and see that the Lord is good and to receive more. How do we receive, receive that word? Let's come back to 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we need to receive it by reading the word of God, by studying the word of God, by memorizing the word of God. Uh, the study that we did on the overcoming life of the believer to be the victorious Christian, remember we talked about abiding in his word? You see, it's a different way of talking about the same important principle. When we abide in the word of God by reading it, by studying it, by memorizing it, by meditating on it, what are we doing? We're taking it in and then we're chewing on it. We're savoring that word of God like a, a just a, a, a wonderful piece of steak or roast beef. We're just going to chew it and get every savor of flavor. And then when it's chewed up, we're going to swallow it and let our body go to work further on it that we might enjoy the nutrition of that protein that we take in. Even so, we need to take in the milk and the meat of the Word of God. By what? Read it. Every day. Is a child going to be satisfied with one bottle of milk a day? If you've done anything with children, you know one bottle's not going to get them for 24 hours. But you know, there's a lot of Christians who we treat the Bible as if a word of a verse of Scripture, that's all I need. We need more, and we need more, and we need more of the Word of God. That we might receive more and more of these precious promises by way of understanding what God has said, knowing who He is, and then putting them into practice in our life. God has given us everything we need for life, and the other word here is godliness. For life and for godliness. This word godliness, of course, is speaking about piety towards God. But not many of us use that word anymore, do we? Piety towards... It used to be a word that believers were very, very familiar with. The word piety is talking about holiness, but it refers to a reverence, a reverence for God that employs a holy living, a life of holiness because I know who God is, I believe in God, and I'm very careful that I want to honor him in the words that I speak, the choices that I make, the actions that I perform. I want to honor God. That's a life of piety, a holy life, a life that seeks to please God every day. And it's important. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, sorry, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And notice how the Apostle Paul, as well as Peter, emphasizes the importance of a life of godliness. Beginning in verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness, and reverence. There's our word, godliness. And notice life and godliness come up together. The life of the believer is to be a life of godliness, a life of piety, a life of reverence and respect for God and his word and God and his ways. Listen, uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'll go there and get this next verse and then I'll give you the listen, an application. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse N. Uh, verse 8, 1 Timothy 4, 8. Notice Paul writes to Timothy, and he says in verse 7, Reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. Now that word exercise means there's got to be an energy put into it. There's got to be an energy and an effort that's going to be put into it. Some of us don't like exercise. We don't even want to stretch. We just roll out of bed and off we go. But the person who exercises does what? Increases their strength and ability. Increases their strength and endurance. We exercise ourselves spiritually towards godliness, a life of piety. Why? Here it is, verse 8. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. You can't take the Cadillac 
or the jalopy with you. You can't take the mansion or the cottage with you. You can't even take a tent with you. You can't take money with you. You can't take clothes with you. But all that you learn about Jesus Christ and who he is, you will take with you to glory. And all that you don't learn about Jesus Christ is going to in some way inhibit you both in this life and the one to come because rewards are going to be given and there will be a loss of rewards. And so we need to understand, as Paul is pointing out to Timothy, the, the importance of it. Here, the illustration has changed once again, as I said. It's exercising. And we all now know exercise is good and important so that I can keep my body fit and healthy and can continue in, in a fit and healthy way through this life. In the same way spiritually, both now and, Tim, Paul says to Timothy, and the life to come there, we are to exercise ourselves towards godliness, a life of holiness. Why? It has value right now. It has value in heaven. The, the believer who is caught up in this world and the things of this world is stunting their growth spiritually, and it will affect them now and in glory in the future. This is important for us to understand as you come back to 2 Peter chapter 1. And so, it's important for us to understand, you show me a Christian who is spending their time in this world and with worldly things, and I will show you an immature child of God. That's it. If you want to grow, then you've got to know. We've already said that in past weeks. How do you know? You've got to get into the Word of God. And in getting into the Word of God, you'll learn about who He is and what He has promised and given us and begin to grow. The Spirit of God begins to do a mighty work. It's His work to change us. But this change is not going to happen because of physical things in this world. It's because of the spiritual things that God has given to us. And I would have you to note from these statements... A child growing, 1 Peter 1, 2. Uh, sorry, 2, 1. 1 Peter 2, 1. Uh, exercise building, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. These exercises and these illustrations of growth point out that when you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't all of a sudden mystically, you don't all of a sudden mysteriously become a grown Christian. The illustration is a baby who needs to grow. The illustration is a person who needs to exercise. And so the believer needs to employ these blessed things that God has given to us, these promises in his word that we might grow. Do you get it? There's some personal responsibility here. And if you want to grow, then you've got to get to know what God has said in his word so that you might get to know who he is and begin to employ it in your life on a, on a, a daily basis. Uh, all things that pertain to life and godliness, God has given to us. Now in verse 4, Peter, he's going to lay it all out in detail in verses 5, 6, and 7. We'll see it, all these things. We're going to look at them, these Christian virtues that are spiritual things. But in verse 4, Peter calls the promises out. The great and the precious promises that God has given to us in his word. Now this word promise is only used three times. Notice please, it's used in chapter 3 and verse 13. Second Peter 3:13. And here Peter uses this word again and he says, "Nevertheless, we believers, those who have like precious faith in Christ, nevertheless we according to his promise look for a new heavens and a new earth." in which righteousness dwells. There's one of the promises. A new heaven and a new earth. That's just one of them. But God has promised there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. So that teaches you something about God, doesn't it? It teaches you he's not satisfied with this present earth. As a matter of fact, God has cursed this earth. Genesis chapter 3, thorns and thistles, so that by the sweat of our brow that we might work and receive the produce that comes forth from the earth to supply our needs? Oh yes, you say, well, I don't do that. Somebody does. And you sweat and earn money so you can go buy the things that they buy. Their sweat <laughs> grew so that you can what? You can eat and live. 
and wear clothes and buy a house for shelter. God cursed this earth. And in so doing, God then made a promise. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. And guess what? There won't be any toil and sweating. There'll be work, but it won't be toil and sweat. It'll be like Adam and Eve before sin entered the world and before the earth was cursed. But this earth is not only cursed. It's also judged and bears the scars of that judgment. Because we're told about the great flood in Noah chapter 7. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 7. Noah's the guy who survived it because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God has judged this earth. Why? Because of sin. And this earth bears the scars of the global flood. You just go to the Grand Canyon. You just look at any map that's a globe-shaped, and you look at the Atlantic Ocean, and you will see, like a baseball has a seam right down it, the Atlantic Ocean has this ugly seam at the bottom of it where the fountains of the deep were broken up. Even today, even today, volcanic action and, and mountains that are rising because of the sliding of the plates of what? The fountains of the deep that were broken up. Continually, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions are affecting this cursed earth that was judged by God because of sin. And yet, do you know that some people want this earth to be their happy home forever? Now, I admit to you, this earth still has a lot of beauty in it. It does. What my wife and I have been enjoying, today's the first day of spring, we've been enjoying hearing the birds over the last few days. They were telling us spring was coming a little early. <laughs> the birds are just singing, and it's pleasant, isn't it? There's so many things that God has created that are beautiful and are worth enjoying. But listen, this earth is cursed. And God has promised to bring a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Wow, that's a promise of God. What does that teach me about God? Well, it teaches me that God is awesome. God who made this present earth and cursed it and judged it has also the ability to make a brand new one. And we read about it in Revelation chapter 21. Turn there. It's just a couple pages forward. Revelation chapter 21 these are just, this is just one of the great precious promises that God has made. A new heavens and a new earth. There's an eternal day coming. Are you ready for it? Are you looking for it? Are you excited about it? If you read the scriptures and you get a little sense of it, you will be. Because it's a glorious, beautiful heaven and earth that's coming. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. John, who's caught up and in a vision, writes of these things in the book of Revelation, says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Look at verse 4. In this new heaven and new earth, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And look at this. He said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. Aren't you glad that God told John to write it? In chapter 10 of this book, John heard things and God said, seal it up. We don't even know what he heard. But we heard this promise. God made it back in Isaiah. You don't have to turn there. Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 and 18. God promised there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Praise God, his holy name. That's just one promise. And, you know, when we talk and give opportunity for people to share promises, I don't ever hear anyone say about the new heaven and the new earth. We hear wonderful promises, praise the Lord. Jesus promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus promised, I will go and prepare a place for you. All kinds of wonderful promises. God's given these promises to us in his word. Why? That you might grow thereby. Notice how Peter describes these promises exceedingly great. This word here means the greatest or very great. It's the only time in the New Testament that we have this superlative. And you really begin to get the sense that Peter is overflowing with excitement for the greatness of God's promises and the greatness of the impact they can have in your life if you will but employ them. Peter calls them precious. These precious promises, these precious promises, that pro word precious means of great price, 
It means something that is to be held in honor. The believer is to look and search the pages of Scripture and find the things that God has promised to us and then hold them up as in a place of honor. This word precious is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 to speak of precious stones. There in that passage, Paul talks about wood, hay, and sub stubble. And he also speaks of gold, silver, and precious stones. Guess what? The gold, silver, and precious stones are going to endure the fire of the judgment of Jesus Christ at the Bema Seat. Guess what's going to happen to the wood, hay, and stubble? It'll burn and go away. It's only the precious gems. Think of rubies and diamonds and sapphires and emeralds. By the way, you find all of those in that New Jerusalem in its description when you keep reading in Revelation 21 and 22. Peter writes of precious promises. These are promises of great value. These are promises that are to be held up and esteemed very highly in God's word. We see these things that God has promised and we hold them up in honor and say, I am looking forward to all that God has promised to me. And when you do that, your eyes are lifted off physical things on this earth and onto things in heaven forevermore. Spiritual things. This will have an impact in your life as a believer. James uses this word precious in James 5, 7, and there he talks about the precious fruit that the farmer gets when he is patient and he's long-suffering. He knows that when he puts the seed in the ground, he's going to have to look for the sunshine, look for the rain. He's going to need to do the cultivating, which involves the weeding. And then the precious fruit comes. That which he has endured and worked hard and long for will come. Whether it's those beautiful tomatoes and cucumbers of summer or that wonderful Hubbard squash of the fall, whether it's grapefruits, whatever it is, the farmer calls it precious. And it's wonderful. We look at the flower and we say it's beautiful, don't we? We look at the leaves and we say they're lush, don't we? But we pick the fruit, and it's precious. It is something of great value. That's what Peter calls these promises here. And by the way, in 1 Peter 1.7, Peter there calls our faith precious. Our precious faith, which will survive the fires of judgment and the fires of tribulation, and will bring forth gold in the life of God's children. God's promises are great, and they are precious. And when we understand the nature of this gift, then we, like Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, we begin to realize that it's not the temporal things of this earth that we are looking to, but we are looking for those things which are eternal, laid up for us in heaven. How do you find that out? In this book, in the Word of God, he has made precious promises. Now, just before I leave, what that gift is, all things that we need, everything you need to grow in the spiritual life. Peter talks about great and precious promises that God gives to us, uh, I want you to notice that it's by his divine power that he has given these things to us. Isn't this amazing? The mighty omnipotence of God is how he gives these promises. And because it's the word of God, God has promised, you can be sure it will come to pass. The power of God and the word of God assure that all that God has said, he will fulfill. How do I know? Because God said so. And it's his divine power that is behind his holy word. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Paul understood this in 2 Corinthians. He was made to understand it, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You know it well. There in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, as Paul was crying out that this thorn he had in the flesh, some physical affliction, that he was suffering. I know, someone will come and ask me afterwards, what's the thorn? That's okay, you can come, I'll tell you then what I think. And send you to the word to go search. He prayed three times, Paul did. Lord, remove it, take it away. And Jesus Christ said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. That's what God said. My grace is, what all you need to get through this pain and suffering, Paul, is my grace. Now, I do want you to turn to Hebrews 4, please. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. 
The writer of Hebrews wants to tell us something wonderful, a promise that God has given to his children. Hebrews chapter 4, when you get to the chapter, find verse 14, and I'll read down through verse 16, the end of the chapter. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ? Don't ever let that faith go. Hold fast your confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. That's what Paul was experiencing. A tremendous weakness, this pain, this suffering, the thorn in the flesh. Jesus can sympathize. But was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What has God promised? He's promised that if you come as a believer to his throne, he will give you grace. God will supply his grace. God has promised to show us mercy. We may obtain mercy, we may find grace, and it's going to help us. And so Paul ended that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 with these words, Therefore, I will glory in my weaknesses. I will glory in my infirmities. Why? Because he found that through his weaknesses, the strength of God was made perfect in his own life. That's God's promise. God's promise is to give you grace. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, if you come to his throne of grace. God didn't promise to give you health. God didn't promise that you won't get sick. God didn't promise that you won't get cancer. God didn't promise any of those physical things. What God has promised is to give you grace. He's promised to give you grace. And in receiving his grace, he promises to make your weakness perfect so that you may magnify him for his strength in your life. And so we're told in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And Paul goes on in verse 11 to say, put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Oh, there's another promise, isn't it? That if you put on the armor, you will be able to withstand God's greatest enemy, Satan. In the strength of Jesus Christ, put on the armor. Do you see how this all works together? These spiritual truths to do what? To grow us, to be mature in the faith so that we may demonstrate the awesomeness of our great God. His divine power has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. And Paul found that power to be all that he needed through whatever he faced. And listen, he faced it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul talked about some of the things he faced. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul went on to talk about some of the things he had to face, being shipwrecked, being beaten with rods, being whipped with the leather lash, being stoned and left for dead. Through all those things, what did he find? Jesus Christ was all in all. All in all. And it was sufficient. Come back with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. God has given to us everything that we need. And all these things are found in his word in the promises that he has made to us. They're of a spiritual nature. They're not physical, but they are of a powerful nature to enable us to live the spiritual life in all godliness to the glory of God. This speaks of a confidence, doesn't it? It speaks of an assurance. It's what God wants to give each of his children. And as you begin to open your heart, you begin to grow by employing these wonderful, precious promises. It's a tremendous work of God in the life of the believer. Now, by what means is this gift received? There are two things. We've already looked at one of them. It's the knowledge of God. That's the one we've looked at. But the first one, the means by which we have received these precious promises, is in the very last phrase in verse 3. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. We have been called by glory and virtue. The word call here is the word Greek word kaleo, which means to cry out with a loud voice. It's an invitation. It's an invitation by name. Now, in our Sunday school class, we talked about the word reserved. When you make a reservation, something is set aside for you. And aren't you thankful? I was thinking of a restaurant. You call ahead to a restaurant that's a fancy restaurant, 
And since they have the best food around, because they got the best chef who puts the right ingredients together in just the right way, oh, they have crowds of people who go to that restaurant. So if I want to go, I call ahead and I make a reservation. And when I go to the restaurant and they ask me for my name, they say, oh, yes, right here, 7 p.m., here we have a table that is reserved for you. And they take you over to that table. But here we have an invitation. Invitations are like weddings. They send out an invitation to you to come because they have a reservation for you. There's an invitation. There's an inviting, a calling you. Come, come. Now, Peter, Peter heard this call when he was by the shores of Galilee. As a matter of fact, we're told in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Peter and his brother Andrew and two other brothers, James and John, right? Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, right? And the transformation began in Peter's life, in Andrew's life, John's life, James's life, a mighty transformation because they placed their faith in Jesus Christ. What did they do? They forsook their nets, they forsook their family, they forsook their livelihood, and they followed Jesus Christ. Now that's what they were called to. Peter, Andrew, James, and John were called to forsake all and follow Christ. And that's exactly what they did. And they became evangelists. They proclaimed the gospel of salvation. They became apostles, mighty leaders in the truth of who Jesus Christ is and his plan and program for this age, the church, the body of Christ. To what has God called us? For that, I would have you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I begin here, the call of God is a bigger subject, and there are those who are called to be missionaries, those who are called to be pastors. But before we get to that kind of a special calling, I would have us to first of all consider a general calling which refers to every believer in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, please notice that God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Your calling, if you're a child of God through faith in him, is into the fellowship of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to share in Christ. And we are going to see, I've already mentioned to you, that the goal, the result of this gift, is to be partakers of the divine nature. That's the result. It's speaking about our union with Christ. We'll get to that, Lord willing, next week. But we're still talking about the means, the means by which we are called to this end. The, I mean, the means by which we're invited is the calling of God. And God calls every one of his children to be fellowshipping with his son, Jesus Christ, practicing that relationship that we have. Now, you know what? As you practice that relationship that you have through faith in Jesus Christ, you're going to grow. And as you grow, you will be a strong believer, mature in the faith, in all the truths that God has revealed to us in his word. But I want you to see it's the faithfulness of God to call every one of us into the fellowship of his son. Now, this is important. This is important because uh, there are so many believers who are so caught up with where should I go and be a missionary or should I be a pastor or some what we think of as a full-time uh, gospel worker, of which there are. God calls people to those particular things. But I want you to realize we should not neglect the first and most important step People get caught up with that special call and ignore this important general call. Every child of God is called to fellowship with his son. And do you know something that's very interesting? Those people who receive more of a special call, like Peter, Andrew, James, and John, to, to give their life fully over to the service of the Lord, leave their work, leave their families, and go on and serve the Lord, do you know that they are ones who are already participating in the fellowship of Jesus Christ. It's those believers who understand that I'm called into the fellowship of the Son of God and get busy growing in Jesus Christ that God begins to, through some of those, call them on to further ministry. Why? Here's the reason why. Because God is faithful and he's looking for faithfulness in the lives of his children to do what? I called you into the fellowship of my Son. How important is it? Oh, that we might enter into the fellowship of 
of his son. We'll talk about that. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This call is a general call for every believer to enter into the life of Jesus Christ. The fellowship we have now because we are in Christ and Christ is in us. God has called. He has given an invitation that you should enter in and enjoy all that he has given to you in Jesus Christ. And yet, if you don't read the word of God, you don't even know about these things. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, notice please that Paul writes in verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The call into the fellowship of his son leads us to the call to do what? Live our Christian life looking for one day when we will hear his blessed voice and go home to be with him forevermore into the glory of his son Jesus Christ. What a day it will be when we realize these spiritual things and leave these temporal things and head into the eternal, the glory of Jesus Christ. Are you ready? If you're fellowshipping in the Son, you're preparing your heart for that every day. Every day. If you're not, what a day it will be of awakening when the call comes. If you are a child of God, I called you into the fellowship of my Son. Now I'm calling you home to glory. What a joy and privilege it is to be ready for that call. It's a holy calling. It's a holy calling by which we are called. We see that in Ephesians 4, if you turn there. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It involves the now. It involves the hereafter. The fellowship of his son now and the glory that we will share when we move on to be in his presence in heaven. Paul writes of the here and now, verse 1 of Ephesians 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. It's a holy calling. And God calls us to live in a holy way. Remember? It's life and godliness. What are the things that we have received? We have the things that pertain unto life and godliness. And so that calling, the means by which we enter in, is a holy calling to enter into the fellowship of his Son. Now, how do we enter into the fellowship of his Son? Well, let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll close for this morning. The other part of that is the knowledge. The knowledge of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. Do you know him? Because the degree that you know, taste, and see that the Lord is good, you begin to enter into that fellowship. Uh, we do it practically speaking as we read his word and praying, talking with God, living in service. I'm now living my life looking for opportunities to serve the Lord. Why? I'm in the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. I've learned great and precious promises whereby God wants to increase my knowledge and in doing so, increase my wonderful ability to minister to others. Unsaved, present the gospel to them. Saved, present the same truth that I have learned that will help them to grow as well. Wow, great and precious promises, the knowledge of God. Well, I want to close this morning with just a little bit of an illustration. Can you imagine with me, if you will, of a, an inheritance an inheritance that was spelled out in such terms as this. A grandmother passed away, and in passing away, she wrote out her inheritance to each of her children and to her grandchildren. And to her grandchildren, she told them about her attic. Grandma had an attic, and in her attic, she had a chest. And she said, I leave to you, put in your name, my chest my treasure chest. Can you imagine as the relationship that existed between the grandmother and the grandchild to the degree it was great that the grandchild would want to know, what did she put in there for me? What's in that chest? There would be the desire on the part of the grandchild as quickly as possible to get to grandma's attic and to open the chest and to see what is it that she had laid up for me in that chest. But can you imagine the grandchild who just could never be bothered to go find out what's in the chest? 
What's in there? What did she lay up? The grandchild never knew until they went and opened and entered into the joys of the inheritance that she supplied. Even so, for us, there's an illustration as God's children in his holy word. He has laid up for us great and precious promises. Why? That we may grow thereby. May we, like that eager grandchild, may we as a child of God enter into the precious things of God's holy word to do what? To enjoy what God has laid up for us here, that it may advance us in our spiritual growth for him. I pray that God drives it home to our hearts in a blessed, blessed way. Let's look to him in prayer. Father in heaven, may the greatness and the magnitude of the precious and great promises in your word come home to us in a practical way such that we will enter in to the blessedness of searching the scriptures to find out more, more about you and more about your son, Jesus Christ, that we might grow thereby and be used in a mighty way and be prepared for all that you have laid up for us in eternity. I pray with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.